I'm going to be talking about uh, 5-MeO DMT use in the global population. So all the stuff that I'm presenting today is the result of about two and a half years of data collection and analysis. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to be able to come and um, present this all together for you all. Um, so I am currently working as a cannabis and ketamine assisted therapist at a clinic in Denver, Colorado, which is separate from uh, the work that I've been doing on 5-MeO-DMT, which I started doing while I was in graduate school, working at the University of Wyoming. And this uh, first research team was put together by Alan Davis and Dr. Joseph Barsuglia, um, who did the first uh, comparison study of 5-MeO-DMT to psilocybin. From that study, uh, I have been working with Alan and a few others to create a survey study. And so that survey study led to what we're doing now. So why 5-MeO-DMT? Of all the psychedelics and drugs that people could be using therapeutically, why, why this one? Um, this is a short-acting medicine, and that provides some advantages clinically because it allows for large experiences to happen in a short period of time. Um, it also, anecdotally, has a lot of reports of an ultimate reality or something that's very consistent and um, something that a lot of people have experienced. Um, there's also the unique nature of these experiences that um, again, are, are really easily trackable throughout the um, anecdotal reports that people have put out. So um, we chose to do an epidemiological survey. And, and so for those of you that don't know, epidemiology is the study of um, how different things are impacting populations. So the uh, prevalence of use, the patterns of use, uh, those are the things that comprise an epidemiology. Um, so 5-MeO-DMT is illegal in many countries. In the United States, it was made illegal in about 2002. Um, it's illegal in the UK due to analog laws. Um, and there, it, it is legal in a few other countries, but largely um, is used in an underground or illegal context. Um, so when we started talking about doing this survey, we realized that there were a lot of people in the general population that were using 5-MeO-DMT and reporting all kinds of, of positive results coming from it. Um, and we realized that there, there really is no data on how this molecule affects people. So we decided that there were probably going to be uh, people that were interested in filling out a survey and, and putting some information out there. Um, and, and so we designed a survey to do just that. So in this survey we created, uh, it was a pretty massive survey. So this was a, a survey that took people about 30 minutes to fill out. Um, and it was, it was quite extensive. So as you can see here, um, this is a list of all the different types of things that we asked. So for each one of these, uh, there may have been two to ten questions. Um, so so we got drug use data, we got clinical condition data, and we got experiential data. The drug use data is related to you know, what type of 5-MeO-DMT was used, um, the frequency of use, what doses were used, what were the motivations, um, all kinds of questions about set and setting, uh, and you know, the kind of environments that people were in. And we also were gathering data on the addiction potential of 5-MeO-DMT. So finding out, like, well, how often are you using this? Um, you know, are you f having urges to use it more frequently? Um, we also were gathering data on clinical conditions. So we, we asked questions about physical conditions, such as asthma or um, you know, coronary art disease, heart disease. Um, and we also got psychiatric data, so we asked questions about anxiety, depression, PTSD. And these are self-report items, uh, but they were going to help give us an idea of what people are perceiving, if they're pe perceiving benefits or not. 
And finally, we got experiential data. So we gave um, the mystical experiences questionnaire, the challenging experiences questionnaire, and, the, um, and a questionnaire to measure personal meaning and spiritual significance of the experience. And finally, we also got demographics data. So all these different subsets are, allow us to have a, a general picture of 5-MeO-DMT that could be applicable in a variety of settings. So um, we could look at clinical settings, we can look at um, potential for abuse, so looking at you know, this drug as a recreational drug, um, and also being able to compare this molecule to other substances that are currently in clinical trials like psilocybin. Um, so here's the survey, this kind of like the overview of what it is, and here's a picture of what like a respondent might look like. Um, <laughs> so we, uh, we th you know, after 30 minutes of answering questions. So um, from April until August, we posted advertisements all over the internet, um, and so we got 515 total respondents. Um, so as you can see, the, the demographics of that sample are, are pretty limited, right? We, it was 86% white, 79% um, male. So, um, so there, there, is, there was a, an inherent bias in, in terms of you know, the limited sample size that we got. But um, that's what we had to work with. So um, from the results, so this is, this is kind of the summary of, of the different things that I'll be describing. Um, so we have the epidemiological data, so that's just going to be the kind of overview. We have the therapeutic potential, so we have data showing improvements in depression and anxiety, improvements in PTSD symptoms, and improvements in substance use disorders. Um, and then we also got uh, additional data, and this is the newest data set that we've fi finally processed, which is enhancement of therapeutic potential. So the importance of set and setting, as well as the importance of certain strategies that people use to enhance the benefits of the experience. Um, so the, the general themes that we see are that um, there were infrequent patterns of use. So a lot of people reported using it once a year, once in a lifetime, with very few people reporting using it uh, multiple times in a year or multiple times throughout the lifespan. Um, most of the people reported moderate to strong mystical experiences. So not just uh, an altered state, but an actual mystical experience, um, which as we know from other research, that it has strong correlations to a lot of the, the positive um, benefits that have been coming from, um, from psychedelic use. Um, there are very few slight challenging experiences. So we also know that it's a molecule that seems to be pretty well tolerated in the general population. Uh, and only 1% of those respondents reported legal, medical, or psychiatric problems related to those use. So now we're gonna move into some of the uh, psychological improvements. So um, for the subset of data that we use for measuring depression and anxiety, part of our sample um, was a group that was using 5-MeO-DMT in a structured setting. So this was a, a group that was doing essentially like a ceremony type setting where people were using it um, individually. That setting was similar to what you might see in a clinical trial, right? The, you know, was, had, had some music. It was, you know, there was a facilitator, there was a, an, one person at a time was having the experience. Um, it w they were doing it as part of a community, and there was, you know, there was support before and after. So from that group, 80% of those respondents from that group reported improvements in depression symptoms, and 79 reported improvements in anxiety. Um, and so we also found, uh, similar to s some of the Johns Hopkins research, that the improvements were related to greater intensity of mystical experiences um, and, and having those uh, higher ratings of spiritual significance and personal meaning. <laughs> improvements in PTSD symptoms. So for this um, subset of the data we use from the global population, um, and 79% reported uh, improvements. And again, those people who reported improvements had the greater intensity of mystical experiences um, 
as well as stronger beliefs about the spiritual and personal significance of the session. So for people that, you know, that maybe it didn't have as much spiritual significance, even if they had a mystical experience, um, it, it, their symptoms didn't change as much or, uh, or some, in some cases worsened. Um, and so there were no differences in the intensity of the acute challenging physical or psychological experiences between the respondents. Um, and then for substance use disorders, again, um, we see this like recurring theme of having these powerful acute mystical experiences correlated with um, perceived reduction in these, um, in these types of disorders. So again, um, having the positive beliefs about the experience, having these powerful mystical experiences all really strongly contributed to, um, to reported improvements in, the, um, in substance use disorders. And one thing that's interesting uh, specifically about the substance use disorders is that the improvements were correlated with higher ratings of people experiencing their own death. So that set it apart from, uh, from the depression, anxiety, or PTSD groups um, where, you know, actually experiencing this kind of final transcendence um, seemed to have a strong correlation there. So how do we improve? Uh, how do we ensure positive experiences? How do we ensure that, that something like this can actually be of benefit? Um, and what, what are some of the things that can be done to, to do that? So in our data, we looked at set and setting. So um, in the set and setting subset, we compared the structured group to the general population, right? So we had the structured group who you know, is using it in this very uh, methodical way. And then we, we saw like, well, how does that compare to the way that you know, Joe Schmo was doing it in his apartment? Um, so we, we noticed that the structured group produced lower ratings of challenging experiences um, and higher ratings of personal meaning, spiritual significance, and improved subjective well-being. So all of those being uh, very strong correlates for improvements in, in disorders. So again, like we're seeing this trend that actually using um, this substance in that controlled structured setting is actually showing those, more of those benefits. Um, and the structured group also reported using 5-MeO-DMT less often. So greater benefits, but less frequency of use. And uh, finally, we, we looked at what are some of the strategies that, that people are using. So we looked at the whole, um, the whole general population, and we were looking at, um, we, cr we came up with 14 general uh, strategies that people have reported anecdotally. And we just kind of put them out there and said, well, which one of these or how many of these do you, have you used in your sessions? So, as you can see, the most common were preparing a comfortable place, uh, preparing a safe space, and removing distractions, followed closely by obtaining from a trusted source. So these are all harm reduction strategies that, that the people in the general population are using and, and are related to um, other substances that are used. Um, we found, we also found correlations of specific of strategies with mystical experiences and benefits. So um, focusing on intentions, using ceremonial shamanic techniques, using with a guide, meditating prior to the session, um, and abstaining from sex prior to the session, and having a friend to talk to for integration, all of those were most strongly related to the higher intensity of mystical experiences um, and, and those lasting cognitive benefits that, that people ideally want to see and, and we would want to see um, for a clinical trial, for example. Um, and then using, uh, preparing music for the session, using with a guide, and obtaining substance from a trusted source um, were the greatest indications for um, having less challenging experiences. So, um, so notice how using with a guide is, is there twice. 
Um, so it, there is something there, especially having another person present um, to help with a challenging experience. So um, we also have some limitations in this study. So like I said before, um, you know, we have a, a sample that was you know, mostly white men. Um, and you know, that could be for a variety of reasons, right? We can, um, we can say that there's, there's a certain population that's on the internet that's going to be seeing the ads that we put out. Um, it could also be that you know, men are oftentimes related to being more risk-taking. And so using this molecule that um, you know, there's not much information about, has a high rating of intensity, um, that may be another factor. Um, so, so in the future, uh, it would be good to have a study that had a more, uh, a more wide range and a more, uh, I guess, a heterogeneous uh, sample. Um, we also couldn't control for the type or dose of 5-MeO-DMT used. So, you know, in the survey, uh, the doses fluctuated wildly. You know, some, some people were reporting using, you know, 40 milligrams, which is on a very high end, and some people were reporting as little as 3 milligrams and having, you know, these big experiences. So, um, so not really being able to know what, what is the purity of, of what people are using, what is the source of what people are using, um, you know, that that gives that was another limitation that we had um, and and uh, and even though we were able to separate out like different types of 5-MeO-DMT we excluded a lot of people that reported using like plant extractions and in, in several cases just because there's there's not a lot of information of like plant sources that are very rich in 5-MeO-DMT um, this is also a cross-sectional design so we only were able to ask questions after the fact so we, we don't have a before and after picture of, um, of how people were doing. So, um, so being able to, again, you know, um, Malin is going to be presenting an example of, you know, more ideal design where, you know, we can have a snapshot before and after. What happens uh, immediately after using 5-MeO-DMT? So, so our study being cross-sectional was all just, you know, after the fact, like, oh, think back on your experience and, and do you think that you've had these improvements? Um, so we're getting a, a general picture, but it's not high definition yet. Um, again, you know, we have self-report and volunteer biases, so people who are choosing to volunteer uh, to sit down for 30 minutes to, to write about or fill out a survey, um, they may be more motivated if they had had a positive experience. So those, those limitations are important. Um, also the expectancy effects, so if people are hearing and reading and watching videos about 5-MeO-DMT and then they go and do it, um, they may be influenced by those things. So, so there are those aspects also play a role. Um, and so because of that, uh, we're limited, we can't really make, we can't really make solid conclusions and that, that just means that more research needs to happen. Um, this is, uh, we still don't understand fully uh, what are the mechanisms of action, what are all the different things uh, that contribute to, um, to the, the benefits of 5-MeO-DMT and the potential. Uh, what we do know is that it seems very interesting and there, is, there does seem to be potential and people are reporting um, generally positive things from it. So, um, so as I was saying, you know, controlling set and setting, trying different routes of administration and seeing if those have an impact on mystical experiences, um, doing a, a study of pharmacokinetics so, so we can understand what it's doing in the human body, um, how is it being metabolized, and uh, how well tolerated is that in the general population. Um, and as I was saying, you know, having more diverse populations and having a longitudinal design. So thank you and...